Well, it's less than a month away. Uh, not my birthday, although that is about a month away. But it's the Believe in Shipley mission I'm talking about. Although you may have noticed on the publicity and on this leaflet you were given this morning, it's not actually called that. It's called a festival of Christian faith. A little bit later, I want to explain why that's a much more appropriate title for it than mission. Now, leading up to it on these Sundays in September, we're going to have a series of sermons based on this book, which is called Surprise the World. Mostly, these sort of books, which are really about doing mission, I'm a bit cynical about because people give you lots of advice that doesn't seem to connect very well. But actually, this book, I think, has got a very sound approach and has got some very helpful ideas in it. And if you can get hold of a copy, it's well worth reading in preparation for what's going to happen, this celebration of, or festival of Christian faith at the end of the month. The starting point of this book is that the author suggests that as Christians, we need to live questionable lives. Hmm, questionable lives. Now, by that, I don't think he means that it's uh, honouring or it's a, a good advertisement for Jesus for us to be attending the casino every night or be seen leaving houses of ill repute in the early hours of the morning. Not that sort of questionable. It's much more like the story of a mother who was taking her young son around the zoo. And as they looked at the different animals, he was full of questions. Why does that elephant have a long trunk, he said? And she replied, well, I'm not really sure. And then they came to the giraffes and he said, why do these giraffes have long legs and a long neck? Oh, I don't know that, she said. And then they went into the reptile house and he was very excited by the snakes. And he said, well, but why don't they have legs and feet? And his mum said to him, search me. And by this time, he was getting a bit concerned that he was being a nuisance asking all these questions. So he said to his mum, you don't mind me asking all these questions, do you? And she replied, oh no, it's by asking questions that you discover things. <laughs> well, perhaps he wasn't discovering very much, but you can see the point, can't you? It's that when we begin to ask questions, that we really begin to understand things and enter into things. Education is not about filling up children with knowledge, like pouring water into a container. Education is about inspiring children to ask questions and to be excited about what they discover by doing so. And it's a great pity that those who have designed our exam-based curriculum in schools over the last 30 years don't seem to appreciate that at all. Now, you may have noticed in the Gospels that often when people ask Jesus something, he replies to them, not with a pat answer, but he asks them a question to dig deeper into what's going on. The story of the Samaritan ends not with Jesus explaining what it's about, but with a question to the people, who was the neighbour to the man who fell among thieves? And at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus doesn't tell the disciples who he is. He asks them, first of all, who do the crowds say that I am? And when they tell him that, he then says, but who do you say that I am? And you see, I think in the end that sharing Christian faith is not about giving people a carefully worked out explanation of everything that's all in place. It's actually encouraging people to ask questions. Questions about life and what its meaning is. Questions about what faith in Jesus is about. And one of the ways that we can do that is by living lies which raise questions in people's minds when they see the sort of people we are and what we are doing. Living questionable lives. Now, the other main point that this book makes is about evangelism. Often Christians think mistakenly that when you follow Jesus, that automatically you must be an evangelist. But the Bible, and especially Paul in his letters, doesn't actually say that. 
What he does say in Ephesians chapter 4 is that there are a list of things that people are called to as Christians. One of them is evangelism. But there are others too. Callings to be prophets, pastors, teachers, and various other things too. And his point is that we're not all called to be evangelists. Some people are and have a gift from the Holy Spirit to evangelise through their speaking. That's not the calling for all of us. But it doesn't let us off the hook. Because though we're not called to be evangelists, we are all called to be witnesses. Because we all have a story to tell about the difference Jesus has made in our lives and what we know about him. And the important thing is how we go about sharing our story. Now, when I moved to Bradford about 11 years ago, <coughs> soon after I got here, I was down near Waterstones in the centre of the city, and I noticed a small group of people gathered around, holding up a banner, and one of them had a Bible open, and he was shouting at people who went past, and he was saying things like, Turn to Jesus now. Repent of your sins. The blood of Jesus has washed you clean. <clears throat> and what he was saying might have been true, but the way he was doing it was just turning people off. And as they walked past, you could almost see them saying, oh, there's a bit of a nutcase here. And that's where our readings this morning have something to tell us. In the letter to the Colossians, Paul tells Christians there, first of all, to devote themselves to prayer. That's a very good starting point. All that we do needs to begin in our relationship with God in prayer. And then Paul says to them, pray for me in my work of evangelism. Pray for those who are gifted to be evangelists, to be leaders and preachers. But then he says to them, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. That's a very good little sentence, isn't it, or phrase for this uh, celebration, this um, festival of Christian faith at the end of the month. Make the use of every opportunity <clears throat> to help people, encourage people to come to things, to talk to people about them, to come and share with them in it. And then he says... It's very important, I think. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Let your conversation be always full of grace. That's the very opposite to that very earnest young man who was shouting at people down near Waterstones in Bradford. We need to be gracious when we talk with people, to create opportunities for them to ask questions and to listen to enter into what they are saying, instead of jumping in with pat answers. And that's why I believe that what this is termed as, the, as taking place at the end of the month, a festival of Christian faith, is a very good way of describing it. Because it's not about shouting at people about the Christian message and trying to bludgeon them into believing. It's creating opportunities in interesting and hopefully enjoyable events that people may come along to, to take part in, and then stop and think a bit and start to ask some of those deeper questions about life and about the Christian faith. But in the end, what will speak to people most clearly is what they see in our lives. Most people don't come to Jesus or find their place in God's kingdom by reasoned argument. We mustn't discount the reasonableness of Christian faith and the people who set forth arguments for it. And for some people, that's a great help to them in finding faith. But actually, I think most people come to Jesus because of the effect they see he has in the lives of others, in the lives of Christians. And that's what Jesus was on about in that reading in John's Gospel. In that he says, 
love one another. And then he goes on to explain what that means. It's not just love one another. He says, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. The measure of love is the love that Jesus has for us. And the measure of that love is his taking that path to die on the cross for us and to give everything, his life and everything, for us. He says, love one another as I have loved you. By this will all men know, will all people know, that you are my disciples. And I believe that's not just an inward love for the Christian community, <coughs> Christians within the church loving each other. I believe it's a love that has to flow out from the church, flow out from Christians to embrace the world. And that's what begins to make a difference. It's very interesting in this book, he gives an example which I didn't know about and I learnt from. If you read books, you'll find you learn things, it's great. And in this book, he tells about, in the time of the early church, how the Roman Emperor Julian was reacting to what Christians were doing. And it was interesting because his concern was that because Christians were offering caring for the poor, feeding them and giving them a sense of worth and offering hospitality to them, that it was leading many of them to become Christians and followers of Jesus. And that didn't suit Julian at all. What he wrote was this, it is disgraceful that the impious Christians support not only their own poor, but ours as well. And with their love and hospitality have led many into their faiths. While all see that the people lack aid from us. And Julian's reaction was to start a programme himself to feed and to care for the poor. But it failed because he couldn't motivate people to carry it out. When I worked for the Church Missionary Society, I knew two ladies who had worked for many years in the city of Sana in the Yemen. They were nurses at a hospital there. They were not allowed to say openly anything about the gospel or anything about their Christian faith. So they did it by the love that they put into their work. And often they said they found themselves singing inwardly as they went about their work that chorus which says, they will know that we are Christians by our love. And really I think the big issue for you and for me in this festival of Christian faith at the end of the month is what will people see in your life and my life that speaks to them of the love of Jesus and the change that he can make in human lives. When Jesus sent out 72 of his followers in Luke's Gospel, he told them that their task was not to convert people, it was to prepare the way for where he would come. And I believe that is what we're told to do. That's what is the task that God puts us into our hands, to prepare the way for God in Jesus to come into people's lives. And in this book, Michael Frost suggests that the way we do this is by arousing curiosity amongst those who know us, which may then lead to them asking questions about what our lives are about, because our lives somehow stand out to them. They raise questions, they're questionable lives. He has a very interesting phrase in it. He says, living a fine, upstanding, middle-class lifestyle in the suburbs does not evoke questions. That's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? But he goes on to suggest that we need to develop a set of rhythms or habits that foster a lifestyle that intrigues others, that makes them ask questions about why we are the way we are. And we'll be exploring how we go about doing that in the sermons in the coming Sundays.
The question is, are you and am I living a questionable life? The kind of life that will evoke questions and intrigue others, which may in the end, through those questions, lead them to know Jesus and to find the fullness of life that he offers to them and to us. Amen.